So we have a second thread so that the Java virtual machine will manage between the two threads and allocate sufficient time to each so that as we interact with the screen through the GUI by touching it, uh, touching a spot, touching an empty space or whatever, it can handle our action while still handling all the animations that are running and the updating of the scores and the updating of the lives and so on. So that's why we have, we create a separate thread. And here's our thread. It's a runnable, which indicates it's a thread. When this runs, it adds a new spot. All right. It adds a new spot by going in and randomly generating a couple of coordinates. starting and ending points. So x, y, x2, y2. We then inflate the layout for the untouched. So the layout for our spot, which is untouched, we go and we inflate that. We add it to our spots queue. We set a couple parameters of that. Then, in effect, we have a little if statement here. This is a code that effectively flips a coin and determines is this going to be a red spot or a green spot. That's sort of a shorthand for an if statement there. It does a random number generation. If it's zero, it's going to be a green spot. If it is red, it, uh, or if it's not zero, in other words, if it's one, since we're generating an integer less than two, it's either going to be zero or one, um, it will generate um, a red spot if it's not zero, in other words, if it's one. Questions about this so far? We set some coordinates to it, and then we go and add our on-click listener to the spot. We need to know what to do when this guy gets clicked. All right. Notice that this listener doesn't have a lot of code in it. This listener simply calls the touch spot method and it passes the spot to it. Can you explain it in lay people's terms or in just plain English, not in programming language? Why we need to pass this touch spot method, why we need to pass it a spot? Why are we passing it spot? something to interact with. Uh, another way to put that is we have to tell this function which spot got touched. All right. So what this code is saying here is on the on-click listener, when this spot is touched, call the touch spot method and pass yourself to it. All right. Because on the spot, we're saying pass the spot. So we're saying pass yourself, you know, we're setting it on click listener to say, hey, when you're clicked, report to the touch spot method 
and send yourself. All right. We didn't have an argument here. That touch spot method would have no idea which spot got touched. So we wouldn't know which one may disappear and all those sorts of things. So that's why we have to pass at the argument. And we saw something similar to this, I think, in the in the flag game where you generated um, you generated buttons based on um, you know based on the, on the choices for um, the flag. We set an on click event on there because it had to know which one got clicked. So we had to pass to that whatever that click handler was, whatever that function was. We had to pass which button got clicked so that we could do something with that. Because we're obviously not going to do the same thing for each when different buttons are clicked. We're going to do the appropriate thing for the appropriate button. Same thing here. We're going to do the uh, touch spot uh, method, but we need to know which button got or which uh, spot got pressed. So we're passing at that spot object. We then go and add that spot to the relative view layout. All right, so we're effectively we're adding this spot onto the parent, all right, onto that parent layout. That's why it can float around anywhere you like. It likes rather. Now. is we set the animation for this. And we do this in sort of a clever way. This instruction here looks like a mouthful. Right? Spot.animate.x.y.scaleX.scale1.setDuration.setListener. There's a whole string of functions. This actually is a neat little way to do some shorthand here. And I want to take a minute to explain this just so that, so that we're clear on exactly what's going on here. Because at first glance, that may seem a little confusing. I did not want to do that. And it's going to make me pay by taking a few minutes to power up. you can't do right at this point.
Alright. The animate method, alright, good, we're showing, returns a view property animator object. Alright. So when I say animate, that function returns a view property animator object. What is in that view property animator? Every one of these methods, almost all of these methods, returns a, re a view property animator. All right? So that's the two things that I want you to remember. That there's a method on views called animate. It returns a view property animator. Every one of these methods also returns a view property animator. So, let's make sure we're following how this works. Here's my little spot that's going to be flying over the screen. This is an image view. It has associated with it a view property animator object. All right. This has all bunch, a whole bunch of different properties, like the ending X position, the ending Y position. The size, the ending size, the ending alpha, and so on. Let's think of a simple example of something going from a y position of, of or actually an x position of 0 to an x position of 100. All right? If we just wanted to have it go across the screen like that, we'd set it, you know, we'd set starting position to be zero, and I'm only going to consider the one dimension. Dimension. Then we'd set an ending value of 100, and then what the animation would do it would be to take it from zero and move it to 100. So we can do a nice little linear move there uh, on that. We could also then play with some of these other properties. We can make it get bigger. We can make it get smaller simply by putting in an ending size. We can make it bigger or smaller. We can make it fade simply by putting an alpha in there. So we can specify all these parameters of this uh, view property animator and then when this is going it will then animate that object and do those things and make it go uh, and, and do its thing. There's other properties about this uh, with this uh, class too and, and we'll get to them uh, in you know, as we uh, view our example. So, we have a statement like this, spot dot animate. What that does is that returns a pointer to this guy. So this function returns a pointer to this guy. So right now it's going to return that views view property animator. What do we do on that property animator, view property animator? We call the X position. So remember we added X and X2, X2 being the end position. We set the X property of this object that we're pointing to, to whatever that X2 value is. So we've set the X value. When we do that, this function returns itself. Not, not itself in terms of the function, but it, itself in terms of the view property animator. 
that was being addressed. In this way, we could chain our function calls together to write some really succinct code. We could have wrote this code like this. Spot animate x, x2. Spot animate y, y2. Spot animate and then have a list of functions, and we could have like eight lines of code here. Or we could chain them all together on one line. That just makes for some succinct code. And it's pretty straightforward once you understand that every time we're calling a function on this view property animator, that function returns the view property animator. So we grab a reference to the view property animator through this, we set the x, the, this function also returns itself, so we can set the y on the same view property animator. So we're just chaining those functions together. And in that way, again, we can write, take one line of code and replace the eight lines of code. We actually set with this six properties of this animation, of this spot's animation. So we're saying, hey, grab the animation, view property animation for this spot, set the x to this x function is going to return that view property animator again. Set the y, the ending y value. Set the ending scale for the height and the width, so x, y. If we didn't do those together, it would be sort of distorted. Set how long we want this animation to go. And then last, set the listener for it. So we set all these properties for that spot's animation. All right? All in one fell swoop. The set listener sets things to do, like when this is created, and things to do when this animation finishes. Right? Because What does it mean if the animation ends? In a nutshell, it means that the thing disappeared and we missed it. So the animation ran its course, it disappeared, and we missed it. So we need to get charged for a missed spot. So what this listener does is when the animation starts, it adds itself, adds the animation, to that queue that we had for animations. All right. We've already added the spot somewhere up there to the, um, to, to the spot queue. Now we're adding the animation to the animation queue. Remember, we have those two queues. When it's done, when the animation has run its course, we remove that animation. The comments here are meaningful. Why do we even need to put this in the queue? Won't the animation go and do its thing? We need to keep track of all the animations so we can cancel it. All right, so if the game is canceled, we can go and we can clear all those animations out. That's why we need the queue of them. That's why we need a reference to all the animations that are going on. If the animation ends, in other words, it's gone all the, all the way through its course, and it ends. We do two things. We remove the animation from the queue, and then we look to see if the spot still exists. Because guess what? If we 
touch the spot, we get rid of it. We remove it from the spot queue. All right, we have that code up here. We call that touch spot method, which we'll look at in a minute. And what does that touch spot method do? Well, it gives us credit for the points and all that sort of thing. But one of the other things it does is it removes it um, from uh, the queue. So effectively, what number, what, what, what that on, on animation end does is it gets rid of the animation. So that, that animation is finished. We no longer need that reference around. And it looks to make sure that that spot still exists. Because if that spot still exists, it hasn't been removed from the queue. If it hasn't been removed from the queue, it hasn't been touched. So if that animation runs its course and that spot still exists, we missed it. So it's going to call the miss spot method. Again, I hate to beat a dead horse, but notice again how this handler, this listener, doesn't have a lot of code in it. All the real, you know, important sort of work happens in the methods that we call. For example, we have a method to call when we miss a spot. We have a method to go when we touch the spot. So all those things, um, you know, all, all the details of losing a life and getting the points for it, all those are handled by other code. Last but not least, we need some code to handle what if someone touches the view but doesn't touch a spot. And that's effectively what this does here. It plays the sound, it deducts some points, and it displays the score. I don't think you lose a life, so you're fine, but you do get the points taken off. If we touch the spot, what do we do? Well, we remove the spot from the queue. All right. Remember, we need to remove that from the queue because we're going to use that later on to tell if that spot, the animation for that spot finishes, is that spot still around? We then go and increment our score, increment the, 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 the spots touched, play our sound. If there are more than, if we've gone past the number to get to the next level, we then go to the next level. And notice that each time we go to the next level, we decrease the animation time by 5%. So we take 95% of the current animation time. So I think initially it starts out at six seconds for the whole animation to run its course. After we've gone to level two, it takes 95% of six seconds. And then level three would be 95% of that, and so on. Therefore, going in and making um, the um, making the, uh, the, the game more harder as we go up to level. You actually, once you get to another level, I forgot about this, you actually get an extra life. All right, so it goes and it effectively adds the life to it. Then finally, it, disp uh, it displays the scores, and if the game isn't over, it goes and adds another spot. So if you hit one, a new one pops up to take its place. Miss spot again goes and does kind of what you would think it would. It plays the, the sound. It checks to see if um, there's any lives left. And if not, it, uh, it, it uh, or, or if there are no lives left, it uh, says the game's over and you're done and it keeps track of the highest score, saves that in the stored preference. That's kind of interesting because what it does is it never keeps track of how many lives you currently have, all right? There's no integer or anything for the number of lives that you currently have. It tells how many, if you have any lives left, by looking at how many images are in that linear layout. So it looks at that linear layout, the section of the layout that, that, that holds those little images, those uh, indications of life, and counts how many children are in there. Because each child in there is a little picture of a 
face, which indicates you have an extra life. So if there's two images in there, there's two children, there's two lives. The nice thing about doing this way is there's only one place in our program that needs to be right as far as the number of lives go. All right? You might be tempted to create an, in, an integer or something like that to record the number of lives. If you do that then, you have to make sure that you keep consistent the value of that image, uh, integer and the number of images that are being displayed for the lives. All right? Old colleague that I used to work with always said, you know, have one version of the truth. Another way to say it is if you only store something in one place, you can't possibly have an inconsistency. All right? Could be wrong, but it won't be inconsistent. So by doing a little trick there of counting how many children are in uh, our little lives layout area, we get rid of the need to have to store as an integer the number of lives. Because the assumption is, is that however many little pictures are there, that's how many lives we have. Any questions about this so far? Okay. What I'd like to do is, I'll have to give some thought, I'd like to possibly tweak this game a bit on Wednesday. We'll have to think of some things that we could do to um, add to it to, to maybe make it more interesting or, or something along those lines. One good way to learn a program, and one way, good way to learn programming, in fact, typically this is how most prog programmers start off, is by doing maintenance programming. In other words, what if I were to say, okay, I, in addition to the red and green little guy, I also want to have a blue little guy, all right? How would I make that happen? And, and to know what all you need to do to do that, you know, requires, you know, some understanding of the code and, and where things are, are put and, and so on. So I'll create a, a list of like a handful of things to, to change in this application, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll play around with that. All right, we'll see you over in lab.